Alrighty, we are ready to get started today. How is everyone doing out there? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn. Mr. Jeff Gannon, how's it going today? It's going great, Andrew. How's it going with you? It is going fantastic. We hope it's going fantastic for everybody else as well. If you do want to get access to our stock idea website, feel free to go to focuscompounding.com. And if you do sign up and you like some money off of your monthly price, use the podcast promo code, which is podcast, and it'll take $10 off of the monthly price indefinitely, as long as you do stay a member. What's your Twitter account so people can follow you on Twitter if they want to? At Jeff Gannon. You want to spell that for them? G-E-O-F-F-G-A-N-N-O-N. There you go. And mine is at Focused Compound. No, not not plural, just compound. No ink either. Right. Yeah, I ran out of characters. So today we're going to be talking about our real life investing checklist. Okay. And this is sort of fun fact for everyone. Jeff doesn't really ever know what we're going to talk about on the podcast. I mm-hmm. just kind of bring up a couple ideas and kind of sit down and say, this is what we're going to talk about today. So he does no sort of, um, I guess you could say preparation in that regard. I just throw out a lot of topics and we kind of roll with it. But today we're going to be talking about our checklist. And this is a checklist that you and I had made up yes. for pretty much for what I should do um, before we meet to talk about yeah, a lot like of stocks. The initial phase of looking at stocks. Yeah. Account. And this is only a starting point, mm-hmm. right? Obviously, there's probably a lot more steps that we sort of go over, whether we do that in person or whatever. Um, but this is typically a starting point. What I'm going to do is we're going to chat about it. And then I'm going to actually copy and paste and I'll put it in the show notes for okay. everyone if they want to sort of maybe add that to their own sort of checklist. Mm-hmm. And obviously, checklists are great because the brain has blind spots and you know this just sort of helps i guess sort of mitigate that okay so the first thing that we have on our checklist and this is probably the simplest right is read the most recent 10k and take notes Mm -hmm. and that is what we do and actually we could add that on there so we usually read the most recent 10k and the first 10k the oldest one we can find too yeah yeah and why do we do that uh see how it's changed over the years and to get a better idea of it that way um, there's not a lot of change from year to year in the 10K. So like reading the two most recent ones wouldn't do you as good usually as reading the most recent one in the long ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and as as everyone does know, we, we do print out our 10Ks. Yes, we take so, notes on the 10K. Yeah. yeah, and what I do is I usually, I'll, I'll have like a separate piece of paper and I just mm-hmm. kind of like, um, I'll write like a page number or something and then I'll just like scribble a little note and like underline and right. all that sort of stuff. So that's the first step. Then the next step is, and this isn't, always in the exact same order Mm -hmm. as well it could be a different thing but i'm just kind of going to read off from the list is you want me to find five peers yes and um obviously i'm guessing the logic behind that is because you learn a little bit more about the industry you learn a little bit more about the competitors and you know sort of stuff in regards to that yeah you also see if this stock is cheap uh specifically this stock or the whole industry is cheap yeah because if it shows up on screen or something could be that every stock in the industry is cheap yeah Mm mm-hmm Cool. And how do you typically go about finding peers? Um, that's interesting. It's yeah. hard. It is hard, um, isn't it? You kind of got to like. Yeah, I find Google mostly around. that. Uh, yeah, that I'm able to Google around and stuff. Usually by figuring out the products or things that they mention. It's more based on stuff that I know usually about the industry than yeah. actually finding it on a website. The peers listed on the websites and the industry groups are sometimes pretty, pretty weak. Yeah. Because I mean, like, there's been a couple times where. Um, I don't want to use the website's name, but you could go and then they'll throw out like some like Chinese stocks or something that's just like, they're just pulling it from a screen or a database. It doesn't make sense. And sometimes it's easy to do it yourself. So um, I remember I was talking to someone about Domino's and the peers that I gave her are um, Domino's franchisees. Uh, They're like four big ones that are probably trade in different countries around the world. And uh, just this past week, there's been some things happening in Turkey uh, as we're recording this. And... um, so there's a there's a bottler in Turkey of Coca-Cola. And so it was very easy to say, okay, look at these five peers or so for this that are all around the world, you know, because they have bottlers in, in Europe and in the U.S. and Japan and places like that. And some of them are publicly traded. So those are really easy, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, I bet you could name a lot of industries where you can go, okay, I could figure out a lot of, um, uh, you know, regional peers and stuff. Like supermarkets are a good example mm-hmm. that you have to just go and find out, you know, where they are. They usually aren't competitors. They're peers because they actually don't have overlapping geographies, right? But they have the same business model. So that's what we're looking for. Great. And what I'll do is I guess I'll just sort of read off it and mm-hmm. then you could just explain the logic from your eyes sure. on why we do this. Get the longest term stock chart possible, record the number of years and use Money Chimp, Kager calculator, or mm-hmm. you could use any calculator use or, one, yeah. or Excel, whatever you use, to get a long term return. We're doing this because we want to make sure the stock works geometrically over time. 
Sure. Yeah. So the history of how the stock did um, it for the very long term is a pretty good indicator of actual creation of value. Um, the only things you have to be careful about is um, if we're looking at the stock because it's cheap, we're usually being conservative. Uh, because obviously the starting and ending values are really important for what compound annual growth rate you'll calculate. But if you're looking at the stock because it's cheap, it's gone down a lot, and so the um, compound annual growth rate in the stock will actually have gone down a lot in the last year or something. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you, if you pick a very expensive stock, it can be an issue. Um, so if you picked a stock that's doubled in the last couple of years, and obviously think about what a doubling has an effect on if you measure it from point to point on the compound annual growth rate. So it can be deceptive that way. You could measure from different points uh, to get a better idea. But I think this way is fine for mm -hmm. most stocks. Um, and you, what you want is really long term. So like we're talking 20 plus years, then it's a really good number. If the company has been public for four years, that's not going to tell you that much. Sure. Because, you know, the valuation has probably changed a lot and that's driving most of the stock return. Got it. Next step, get the longest term stock chart possible for the closest peers. Repeat step one. And then I think I put a note. Often we won't have the longest chart for a company because of spinoffs, uh, which right. obviously we operate in that industry or in that area a lot. Compare these Kagers to the overall market. And then again, we want to see if these could work geometrically relative to the market. Right. So is the industry a good industry or not? If you have a bunch of public companies that have all been successful for a long time, that's a good indication that it is a successful it's industry. Sort of like a with CSVI, model. right? We sure. Exactly yeah. with that. Mm -hmm. The overall industry has right. done very well over time. So that's core processors for bank and for banks and um, the four largest ones that are publicly traded all have a pretty good um, compounding you know, growth rates. In fact, they all match the S&P 500 index over a long time or actually outperform it by a lot. Uh, advertising agencies is another good example. You look at that, all the public ones you can find, they're usually pretty good. Um, think if you looked up airlines. Sure. You wouldn't find a lot. That yeah. Now, Southwest, you find have a great record. Yeah. But when you went to find the five peers, you wouldn't have such a great record. But it's also good, though, getting back to why we do it with competitors, because you can kind of see in that regard which which company stands out. Right, exactly. Not so you know black and white. If, you're, if we're looking at a home builder, we may do this a little bit differently or mm -hmm. whatever. But the next step is calculate the EBD sales, EBD, EBITDA, debt to EBITDA. Kager, do the minimum, max, medium, mean, standard deviation, and coefficient variation for all of them. Right, yeah. That's just how we collect the statistics usually, yeah. Yeah, and just to sort of compare it from there. Yeah. Um, and different companies, different things would matter, but it's always helpful to have all of that. Like, I don't want to just talk about what the compound annual growth rate in the EBITDA has been without talking about the sales, right? Because mm -hmm. you don't want to find a stock and say, oh, EBITDA is up 20% a year, but sales are way slower than you're betting on. If you're betting on 20% EBITDA growth, then you're betting on you know, EBITDA margin is always expanding, right? So you always want to use both of those things. Mm -hmm. Whenever we talk about it, I want to hear both about sales and EBITDA growth, not just one or the other. Sure. And this is, just so everyone knows too, this is sort of the legwork that we do beforehand, yeah. I guess. So, right, yeah. before we really talk about it. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. in our, we each go off, research something, come together and talk about whether we sort of rank it as a pretty good prospect or not. Yeah. And mm -hmm. these are the sort of things that we gather. So next step is, and this is step five, do a credit check. And sure. we do net debt to EBITDA, um, how many consecutive years with a profit. Mm -hmm. We From here, we look at the EBIT margin and the coefficient on that margin. And we check the Z score and the F score. Right. So we probably talked those about those before at some point in the podcast. Z I don't think we've talked about the Z score and F score. No? Maybe okay. a long time ago. All right. So Z score is a measure of uh, predicting short-term bankruptcy risk. So like a year out or so. And... Um, uh, you know, it's a value. It's not that important how they get it. It's a statistical method for getting it. That's a little um, uh, complicated. It, it's the F score is easier to figure out how it works. Um, but basically, it works backwards from predicting uh, from seeing actual bankruptcies to predict what sort of things drive bankruptcy, and then it weights the factors. Um, and if you have a Z score below one point, yeah, one point eight or below. That would be a warning that it's uh, predicting bankruptcy. If you have three or higher, it's predicting that there's not going to be bankruptcy. And between those values, 1.8 and 3, it's uh, a gray zone. Um, I mentioned advertising agencies. All ad agencies usually show up as having uh, predicting bankruptcy, and yet they don't go bankrupt. So it's actually best for using on manufacturing firms. Uh, it actually has problems when doing the calculation, especially on pure service firms like that.
Mm-hmm. The issue with them is they have negative working capital, and Z-scores will often predict bankruptcy at companies with negative working capital. Where can people find the Z-score and F-score? I usually just go to like Guru Focus. Guru or Focus like has that. it. Yeah, there's some other places that have it too. Theirs are pretty good. Yeah, I agree. Okay, next step. Um, this is straight from my notes. If a company has a history, get a history from the past financials from Edgar or OTC markets under disclosures or from the company's investor relations website uh, from past 10Ks for the longest term possible. We always want sales in EBIT, which, of course, uh, we, we care about about that. Uh, for the companies we're studying, get the longest term EBIT margin, take mini- the minimum, maximum, median, mean, standard deviation, coefficient variation. Um and then we say calculate the sales CAGR and EBIT CAGR for three year, five year, 10 year, 15 year, 20 year, mm-hmm. if it exists, or the 25 year. Sure. So, one, those are pretty easy things to do, actually. Yeah, like it's if just you're slow. doing it, you can just find other years for it and it's fine. Um, and mostly that's just to have a view of it so that you're not relying on one thing. When I read a lot of write ups and stuff, um, it seems that the person might have only looked at like the last five years or whatever. They don't know the other. Uh, values there and um, like you mentioned Excel is your friend in doing these sorts of things because for the statistical things you can just put it in there and have a regular column or whatever for for min max median mean and coefficient variation standard deviation things like that why do we do the coefficient variation because I don't see that a lot in a lot of people's models. No, no models. one ever talks about the coefficient variation. Uh, so coefficient variation is the relative standard deviation. It's the standard deviation um, scaled to the mean. Um, the reason for doing that is that I always want to know how much variation there is in a series of numbers that I'm being given. So in a sense, it's a measure of how much confidence I have that this real central tendency of these series of numbers is the mean. And that's also why I see things like the median. Um so when you're using the mean, which is what most people are using, they're just using an arithmetic mean. And it may be that a uh, company's had 3% margins year after year after year. So 3%, 3%, 3%, and then that's a really good mean. Um, but in other cases, you might have it be um, 1%, 3%, 5%. And it could be in that order, or it could be in the reverse order. Well, that's a much less reliable number. Uh, Ben Graham has a chapter in security analysis where he talks a little bit about that, where he shows two uh, stocks that have like the same average in their EPS and says, but look how this one really does tend to be around this average and this one doesn't. And so this is just a really easy statistical way to do it using just Excel. Mm -hmm. Um, But you, you can usually just see by looking at the numbers if you put it in Excel yourself or you write it down on a piece of paper and look at it, you can tell the difference between something with a lot of variation and something with almost no variation. Mm-hmm. So stocks we've talked about with no variation is like um, uh, computer services, yep. so CSI, uh, but also things like Omnicom, uh, ad agencies have almost no variation, also things like Costco. So like, look, go look at those companies to see what no variation looks like, and then go find a cyclical company to see what a lot of variation looks yeah. like. Which obviously it's easier to value it when you know it's more predictable like that. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Got it. And then, so I think that's sort of our, our first step in the process to mm-hmm. learn more about the business that we're actually learning about. Okay. And then we, I think from there, we typically, you start to um, develop some sort of opinion on it. And I think we purposely weighed out this, this other step, this next step, um, because we want to have an opinion first before going to see what other people are saying about it. Because the right. next step that we have on here is like check VIC and read the write up, see what other people are saying about it, sort of learn a little bit more about, I guess, this variant perception, if you will. Yeah. So let's talk about that. So that's Value Investors Club. Yeah. So you go on Value Investors Club and read the write ups. What do you think about those write ups? I mean, it, it's just for me the way I do it is sometimes mm-hmm. if there's past write-ups on the business it sort of helps get me or become a little bit more familiar with the history of the company that's the way I sort of okay. think about it sometimes there's short write-ups right yeah so. mm-hmm. nice summary yeah mm-hmm. yeah and you could I guess see the way that other people are thinking about it but again I think we try to develop our own opinion first before going on you know to to doing that mm-hmm. yeah yeah and then the next one we have which is sort of like the journalism part we always talk about uh you know sort of being a journalist is use google to find other write-ups blog posts on the stocks and sort of read them and become again more familiar with it to see what other people are saying about it yeah the background and really narrative background of what the company is where it came from all that stuff mm-hmm. yeah. next up which this one was kind of interesting um try finding historical historical returns of the assets so like for example mm-hmm. cool k-e-w-l yeah. uh, when we talked about like timber and stuff like that you in your write-up that you did on focus compounding you were talking about how timber has compounded at you know a, mm-hmm. a pretty great rate of return and you became familiar with i guess the overall asset or that right. of that company from you know doing a lot of research on that yeah i think in that write-up i included some timberland returns from the 1960s through like 2000 or so yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. 
And so that's, you know, help. I mean, it's 2018 now, so uh, that plenty of time has passed since then, but it's helpful to have 40 years of returns or whatever for some period. Yeah. Give you some idea of that. Um, we did basically the same thing for um, Marilena Pineapple in, in Hawaii, um, which was to, to determine if um, the price of raw land in Hawaii has been going up more than it has in the continental United States and mm-hmm. why that would be. Yeah. Right. And so in both those cases, the returns are, are pretty good so that you want to see if there's like, um, so someone who's owning an asset, the asset might actually have a negative, uh, might actually be losing value each year because it costs something to keep it up and everything. And then its return is pretty much 0%. And then sometimes you might have something like timberland or something uh, or or uh, land in Hawaii. Like the, the example of land in Hawaii, that probably is going to give you returns that are equal to like a long-term bond portfolio, a corporate bond portfolio or something. So it's not like having cash that's not doing anything mm-hmm. when you have raw land there. But having raw land in some other places could be that way. It's not that valuable, and then you're putting a corporate you know, expenses on top of that. Mm-hmm. So it's important to look at that because what if it's going to take 5, 10, 15 years before something happens with the land? You yeah. need to know what the value is compounding at or not compounding at. Yeah, and what's interesting, though, is like when we talk about thinking like a journalist, right, mm-hmm. is – a lot of that information you're not going to find in a 10K or like in right. SEC filings like that. No. Like when we went about valuing MLP, Maui Land and Pineapple, mm-hmm. um, you know, we went to the builder's website, which right. was a public company, and sort of learned a little bit more about, you know, how they're going to develop this land for Maui yep. Land and Pineapple. So I think it's kind of thinking more outside of also the annual reports and sort of the SEC filings and using Google, I guess, as your friend and kind of doing your own little scuttlebutt to learn more about the business and the industry or the asset or whatever. Yeah. I mean, I used a lot of things that were from the state of Hawaii. um, Land records. And other sources too. Yeah. Land records. uh, Also um, land use plans that they have. Even things from 20 years ago and stuff. I had a lot of information about the company that came from that and even some things from local newspapers and stuff. And you put them together to figure out what they're talking about and everything, you know. Um, it can be useful that way, yeah. And Timberland, a lot of it was based off of, you know, they're different asset managers. Things the most famous one is uh, GMO, which is uh, Jeremy Grantham's firm was interested in Timberland. It's a hard thing to sell as an asset to people. Um, they wanted it like as an alternative to an S and P five hundred index or something. But the fact that they were interested in, it, when you learn about it, how attractive that can be. And I actually talked to three or four people whose um, families or they themselves. Uh, have owned timberland for a while in very small quantities at different parts of the country and they talked a little bit about the returns and where you get it from and stuff how, like how'd that. you get in contact with those uh, people they read about it and they're like oh i wanted to talk yeah, to you about so it so they're just familiar with it yeah. not that many people write a lot of yeah sure they're not used to reading things about what are the returns in timberland yeah and sometimes they're curious they're like oh i wonder what our returns in timberland have been now yeah you know so it's just been everyone that's read the articles or the blogs usually yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. that's interesting Okay, and then the next step we have, which is step 11, which because we think about sort of valuing a business, what a private buyer, a logical private buyer would pay for it generally, right? Um, try finding past acquisitions in the industry. And how we do that is finding like proxy statements and you know stuff of that regard to see mm-hmm. what um, multiples these businesses have gone for in the past and sort of learn about that. Yeah, we should talk about that because um, I think it's the SEC document that most people overlook. Yeah. The, the one that's useful that most people overlook. So after a company... Um, uh, has decided that's going to merge, right? So there's going to eventually be filed a merger document, which is going to include things like the background to the deal and things like that. And that will usually include a fairness opinion from a uh, investment bank, which will present um, like historical multiples of peers, usually what they're trading at at the time of the deal, but also it will have a big list um, of the past multiples and sometimes exactly what deals there were. So, like, if you're looking at a um, supermarket that was acquired or something, the fairness opinion may include the last 10 acquisitions in the supermarket industry. Um, And when it does that, you now have this list of specific years and the, like, EBITDA multiples at which specific companies were bought out. It's a great source for looking at, okay, is this stock cheaper than all of them? Is it as good as all of them? Mm -hmm. You know, and really thinking like a private buyer. Yeah. I think it's really just gathering more information to sort of make, you know, I guess improve your opinion of mm-hmm. whatever it is that you're looking at. Yeah. yeah. It's a good way to think about it as the business and what people buy it for as apart from the stock and what the stock's been doing lately. Yeah. Which is what people usually focus, you know, a lot more on. Yeah. No, I completely agree. And then the last step is try coming up with an appraisal, mm-hmm. which obviously 
kind of connects all the dots and that's what jeff and i do uh, before we meet so and we've right. talked about it and you said it a little bit earlier is that we typically just say okay we're gonna look we're gonna talk about this talk next time we meet up go research it and pretty much do all of this legwork to become familiar with the business and then we sort of develop our own opinions we appraise it ourselves and then we come and meet in person and just chat about it right which well, i think mm-hmm. also is and you've talked about it before too the value in speaking to other people about like certain companies that sure. you're going to potentially buy or what you're interested in or looking at in that regard. Yeah. No, I think it's very useful. I mean, I think it, the, what we do is usually the best approach uh, for doing this kind of work, which is that you go off and you do hopefully a lot of like we've talked about deep work before. You do a lot of deep work on your own on something and then you come together and you talk about it. We do not really come up with ideas and start working on them together. And we don't just never talk to someone about an idea we have. We do both parts. But we've done a lot of work on the idea before we're talking to each other about it. So you're getting the benefits of both the kind of things that you benefit from working alone on something with Mm -hmm. and then also together. And that's best for anyone listening to this is that if you find someone that you're both interested in stock on, don't like try to research it together, basically, which will just make each of you do it in not as deep a way. Yeah. But go off, learn everything you can about it, then talk to each other about it. And then they'll just, you know, each of you will have found things that the other person didn't find and you'll be able to talk about it that way once you both have a lot of background on it, you know. But coming in without having, knowing anything just isn't useful to talk to someone about it. Sure. And so it's not like a committee thing that we're doing that way. Um, but it is true that we first learn everything that we can about it, come to it together, and then we can talk about it. And there's a lot of stuff the other person might not have seen. I think it's good too because obviously when we are together so mm-hmm. much and, and we are looking at a lot of the same companies, this allows us to sort of not have any sort of biases and just really have our own opinion and then come chat about it and then kind of just lay it out like that instead of me being skewed by you say, oh, look at this right. or you, you know, vice versa. Yeah, we try to avoid that. And I try to avoid that when talking to other people that I know are going to look at a stock and come to an opinion about it. A lot of times they want my opinion on it right away. And if I think they're not going to really research it or anything, like they're just asking about the stock, but they're not really going to look at it, then I'll give more of my opinion. But if I think that they really are interested in the stock and they'll go off and do a lot of work on it, I don't really want to give some of my opinions that might bias them a lot. Mm -hmm. And I try to avoid doing that as much as possible early on. No, I think that's, I think that's great. So what I'm going to do then, and that's, that's the end of our checklist. What I'm going to do is I'm going to post that in the show notes. So for anyone that wants to sort of, you know, dive into them, read them and maybe pull some things for yourself, say, uh, you know, to your own investing process, they will be there. Um, Other than that, if you do want to get access to Jeff's weekly memo that he does send out, Mm -hmm. on Sunday mornings, go to focuscompounding.com and there's a place for you to enter in your email. Um, And then um, if you also do become a member and you want to read past memos, there's a spot on the website for that as well. Yep. Any other thoughts or anything to add? Nope, that's it. Nothing to add. Other than that, thank you very much, everybody. Have a great day. We will see you next week. Take care.